Hello everyone, I have a treat for you. I'm here with three very special guests. You know them from the hit Netflix documentary, Knock Down the House. I'm here with Paula Jean Swearingen, Corey Bush, and Amy Vlela. So assuming that you just finished the film and you want to learn more about these very fantastic ladies, we're going to get the rundown. So thank you all so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having us. <laughs> we covered your campaign on The Humanist Report for more than a year. But one thing that I wanted to ask you all about was, this is the impression I got. Running for Congress is very difficult. And on top of that, you all have <coughs> different things that make it more difficult for you. First of all, being a woman and running for Congress is more difficult. Second of all, in your positions, you were running against an incumbent, which makes it incredibly difficult. And Corey, one thing that I wanted to ask you about you were talking to someone who said people don't even think they just vote when you were giving him a flyer. So here's what I want to pose to you guys. How do you overcome this voter apathy? Because you guys have talked to hundreds, if not thousands of people. So we'll open that up and start with Corey. How do you overcome voter apathy? Uh, with a message and actually going to where the people are. I think that's the mistake that we make. We we continue to do the same things. Okay, you go to you go to the churches, you go to um, the community events, you go to townships and ward meetings and all of that. But who but and then you go knock doors of registered voters that voted in the last three years. I mean, you know, but what about the people that didn't? You know, so those are the doors we need to knock. Those are the places we need to go. We need to go to the club. We need to go to the bars. We need to go to the grocery store, stand outside we need to go to the thrift store we need to go like places like that go to the family reunion you know and crash it you know that's what we need to do and one thing that really struck me with that conversation you had with this constituent uh cory in the film was that he said look clay has seniority and that counts and you said well but who does it count for and he kind of remarked that i you know you have guts because i haven't seen a democrat want to challenge a clay in ages. So you you guys are all running against these really big names. Uh, Paula, you were running against Joe Manchin, a U.S. senator, which is a little bit different than running in the House, someone with a little bit more name recognition. So what was it like going up against such a gigantic political machine? Well, it was hard to run a campaign grassroots, and we learned a lot of lessons. Um, you know, we did something amazing. Everybody talks about it being a big loss, but actually it's a big win for West Virginia because we have such a, the you know, it's so corrupt here. Our government's so corrupt, and we won 30% of the vote. We got more votes against a sitting incumbent in 75 years, and I got more votes than any Republican on the ballot. Um, so we, we, sh we shown them that, you know, we're tired of the threats to our democracy in West Virginia. And you talk about engagement. We need to see more people run for office. Um, we can't motivate people to go to the polls and vote for people and they don't feel like they have something to vote for. And people, I think people are tired of the lesser two evils. Um, so, you know, especially here in this state, we actually got some great candidates um, in our house this year. We got Daniel Walker and Sammy Brown, really great grassroots candidates, and they're doing a really good stellar job. Um, you see with their teacher strike here in West Virginia, I mean, people are doing big things, but, you know, people are always asking, why, why does West Virginia vote against their interest, you know, their best interest? We have more Democrats and independents registered in this state than we do Republicans. But you look at what happened in 2016 with Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders won all 55 counties. The superdelegates went against the popular vote. Come general time. You know, that, you know, voters registration was down. People wasn't going to the polls because they didn't feel like their vote mattered. People actually showed up for the polls that knew about me and learned about me because they were excited about my campaign because I was a West Virginian. You know, I care about my state and we need more of that. We're not only in West Virginia, but across the country. That's, you know, when, you know, it was hard. The biggest challenge was name recognition. Um, we could have done better. We could, you know, but we also learned really inventive ways to campaign in West Virginia, you know, because, you know, in some districts it's easier. You can walk, you know, even when you run for house, you can walk the district, be done with it. We don't have expansive broadband in West Virginia. It's hard to canvas up on these mountains and rural areas. Some people don't have access to television. They still have landlines. They don't have cell phones, you know, and it's, it's, it comes along with the state because people still don't have adequate sewage systems. And not one of the, it, the most effective things that I did was putting ads in the Sunday paper. 
believe it or not, because people go and buy coupons and people are still buying that newspaper. Um, you just have to be inventive. And when if people decide to run for office, I, you know, there's it's just there's just not one basic way that you can do it. You have to look at your area, your state, and what you're doing, and figure out every day when you wake up how am I going to reach the most voters today. Right, and that's really important, especially when. Like you said, name recognition is such a huge factor. And when you're going up against these political machines who people already know and they don't really even think about, they just realize I'm voting for them. Like there was one scene that really struck me in the film where Ocasio-Cortez was she was canvassing. She was giving out flyers. And one lady said, I'm, I'm going with Crowley. Didn't even want to hear what she said. So you have these people that are established. And one thing that was unique, Amy, with you is that what we didn't see in the film was you actually went up against numerous political establishments. So we kind of talked about on my program, the Harry Reid stronghold in Nevada, which we didn't see. You went up against Ruben Kiwin. You then went on to go up against numerous people who were strong in Nevada in politics. Um, you have a candidate that was endorsed by Joe Biden. So talk about what it was like going through this process, Amy, where you start off going up against one candidate. He essentially gets knocked out. And now you're going, going up against the range of other candidates. What was that like? And how did you adapt? Like, was it easy to adapt that quickly? Because you certainly had a bunch of random things thrown at you. So initially, I thought I was going against, you know, Ruben Kiwin, who was a sitting loved uh, congressman. Um, and probably within a month or so, then then he um, was stated that he was not going to run for re-election. So the field was opened up at that point. And um, I was in the race a little bit. And then we had Pat Spearman came in, who was a state senator. Um, and then we had this now congressman Horsford come in. And he was actually living in Washington, D.C. area with his family. Um, they lived out there the entire time he ran. He actually registered to vote the same day that he registered to run for Congress and rented a house in the, in the district. So he was brought back specifically to run for this seat in, in my district. So it was, it was hard. You know, you can see... The, even the transformation of my physical look, the stress was taking a complete toll on my body, my mind. We were constantly fighting against, you know, curveballs being thrown every step of the way. When it looked like we were actually making gains um, in the numbers, um, it looked really good and promising. Then we had the dump. It was like, shoom. We had an ex-president, an ex-vice president, a current presidential candidate, we had, you know, different unions. All of them came in and it was just like they rallied around this candidate, the chosen candidate. And then he was on the then he was supported by the DCCC. And then there was an outside expenditure of half a million dollars. So as we were fighting our way, he didn't he didn't raise substantially on his own more than I did. But when they saw he wasn't raising, you see that he actually that the money started coming in at that point. You even see Crowley was donating to him. They were more worried about my race than than most others, and and again, they didn't pay attention to uh, the, uh, the the Bronx girl out there that was running a really good campaign mm -hmm. and actually brought them more havoc than I probably could have because of her ability to reach out to the millennials. Yeah, and that's really one thing that stood out to me in the film was the call, Amy, that you had with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So there's this scene where you lost and you have her on speaker and she says, in order for one of us to be successful, a hundred of us have to win. And that was such a profound statement. I think they even put it in the trailer because that really, it shows how difficult it is and it shows each of your stories and how every single one of you went up against basically a machine and not just a local machine, but a national machine, this network that was basically, it seemed like to me, like the mafia, like you were fighting against this huge machine that was so difficult. So here's what I wanna ask you all. Now that you all have experience What's the one thing you think that you've learned that's the most important? Corey, I want to start with you because this fight is not over for you. I mean, the fight isn't over for all of you, but you're running for Congress again in 2020, which is super exciting. So taking this knowledge that you have now, what's going to be the biggest thing that you carry with you into 2020 in terms of knowledge of what you need to do? Um, so one thing that I need to do is not get in a car accident. 
you know, so that's that's on me first. <laughs> um, <laughs> not get hit by a car by random people. Um, but um, and then the other thing would be um, we just got to raise money as much as we want the money out of politics. Right now, we're not there. Um, and so making sure that people understand that we I appreciate every single dime. We all appreciate every single dime. But if you can do three dollars, can you do six? If you can do 27, can you do 50? You know, and so I just so looking at it like that, um, because one thing for us being women, it's harder for us to raise money. And I say it all the time. I need people to know and understand how much how much more difficult it is for us to raise money. And then me as a black woman, it's even harder to raise money. Mm -hmm. People pat me on my head with their words and, you know, and then, you know, and, and I just. It's so anyway, so that's what I'm taking with me is making sure that I get the message out that if you love me, if you want to see me there, I need you to rock with me for, you know, for this campaign and just be able to give whatever you can give to get me there. And I promise it's coming back to you when I get there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how about you, Paula? Because you ran for the Senate and... At first, we were all like, I thought all of you were going to win. Like, I, there was no doubt in my mind. And when I saw that you got 30%, I, Paula, um, I was so frustrated because I'm like, how could she get 30%? But then after seeing all of these primaries, dozens across the country play out, that really was huge, especially for the Senate. So what do you think is the most important thing that you took away from that race? Well, you know, like I said, it was monumental to get 30% of the vote. And... Um, I'm not going to say we didn't make mistakes. We were grassroots candidates. It was our first time running for office. Our field game was good. It could have been a lot better. You know, we could have had, you know, more. I never had a commercial. I think that hurt me. Uh, so, you know, there, there was a lot of organizational things that we could have done. But also, if I run for office again, it's going to be a well-oiled machine because that experience, you know, we gained a lot of knowledge through that experience. One thing I won't do again is because my biggest resistance was the Democratic establishment. Every time, you know, when I was out in the streets, I had Republicans, you know, changing their party affiliation to vote for me. The establishment knows who we are. They know from the second we run for office what we're doing. They know the, the threat to their chosen incumbent. I'll not spend my time at meet and greets with the Democrats and trying to rub noses with them. I'll be out on the streets. I'll be at spaghetti dinners. I'll be reaching people, which I did that anyway. I was at you know, I went to NA meetings, I went to, you know, I went to food banks, I was all over, you know, if I'm going to be a public servant, I want to know what the problems are. I was very schooled on what was going on in the coal fields, and it was amazing to me to learn what else was going on in my state. Um, and I, my advice to any candidate, you know, the establishment, they're going to fight you, they're going to do everything they can to help, you know, to keep, keep that corruption and that power within the party. Reach the people. The people, are, you know, that's who's going to get you in the office. That's who you serve. Find out what the needs are. And like I said, wake up every day and think, how many voters am I going to reach today? Because if you're really in this, to, you know, in this to be a public servant and, you know, that's who you serve. That's who's funding you. So you should be out there knocking on doors, talking to the people. You shouldn't be rubbing elbows with the establishment trying to win them over because you're not. It's just yeah. how it is. That's a really powerful point. How about you, Amy? One thing that you took away, and I want to follow that up with uh, something that Corey had brought up about fundraising, because we got this actually really fascinating scene of you on the phone, and it seemed like probably for hours <laughs> agonizing. And I'll tell you, that scene gave me anxiety because I hate talking on the phone. So just I, you really feel how difficult it is. So um, would you also say that fundraising is probably one of the biggest things that you learn from? Because we all know it's crucial. And you all three, just so people who don't know who saw the film and now are learning more, you all chose to be principled. Zero corporate PAC money, zero special interest dollars. That in and of itself is such a huge thing, but it's also a disadvantage. So what would you say about that, Paula, or um, excuse me, Amy, in terms of um, what you've learned and also the fundraising aspect, how difficult was it? Like, are you worried every single week about we don't have enough money, we're running out, we have to raise money? How difficult is that from someone who's a grassroots candidate? So I knew in the beginning that fundraising was going to be foremost, but I didn't realize how hard it's going to be. You know, it was getting people to actually want to donate when they don't know if you can actually pull it off, right? And and here's the thing. The one thing I would tell you, and this really ties in with, with, with fundraising, 
is, you know, coming from the 2016 election and um, being a part of um, the Bernie Sanders campaign, you know, everything was about ground. But I want to, you know, when we went into this, we had no institutional knowledge. We did, we went in there, we had to learn. So when you see me fundraising, I knew I had to course correct at that point and it was too late. Mm. I did an extensive round game and I had one of the, I had one of the largest districts in the United States. But what I was learning was it wasn't getting the impressions necessary. What I mean is you need to you need to have an impression on people at least three to four times for them to remember your name and get motivated out there to go and vote for you. So we did no mailers. Huge mistake. We have to give we have to know that when we go into each and every district, they're all different in Nevada. Even the ground game that AOC had in her district would not work in my district. 90% of the communities are gated in my district or are way eight hour drive. You know, there's no way to hit them three or four times and have that impression. So it really has to be a mix of ground and, and more of the traditional ways of doing campaigning, mailers, you know, making sure you have a TV ad. And it's not necessarily having the digital. We had a great digital digital campaign. We we were out there hitting the ground, but we made some missteps not understanding and, and not really having anyone tell us how guide us through this process. That doesn't work in every district. So and I'm actually, Mike, writing a book that's going to really put all of this together. And it's, I even have a chapter called How to Lose. Like, <laughs> like you know, when you're running, you need those things that you need to take into consideration and nobody... We had generalizations. I read the book on Bernie's campaign, but that doesn't necessarily translate to a, a congressional or a Senate campaign. So I think going into this, you know, we had lots of losses across this country because we were learning. First thing I'd like to say about that is we know what we're doing this time. And if we're not running, we're helping the other ones run. Yep. Secondly, we lost the race but we did not lose the conversation. That's right. And I think every one of us that ran across this country, either as a justice Democrat or a brand new Congress member or an our revolution candidate, we changed the conversation where we're now seeing a different type of conversation with our presidential candidates right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a movement. We can't be afraid of losing. We still have to be fearless and go out there and raise right back up after we lose and be ready to go again, because we're gonna keep on having losses, but each time, hopefully we're gonna have more and more people get into office. Amy brought up a really good point, one that we don't talk about enough, the point that nobody helps you to know what you need to do, as far as in people that are um, in those positions or, or that have helped people get into those positions. Like it's this closed knit group, this, this, this tight lipped group. Like you can't, we can't tell you the secrets. We can't tell you who you really need to talk to. We can't mm -hmm. tell you how to get into the senior homes. We can't tell you, you know, it's, it's this thing because we don't want you there. We want to keep it within our family or we want to keep it within the people that, you know, that are, that we want to know these, these, um, to know, um, what to do so that they can get those positions. And so that's another way that we, it, it, it pushes us to, to this point. Yeah. And you know, they brought up a good point because Amy was fussing at me when she came up to West Virginia the other night for a screening of the film. Cause I was saying, we don't need $2.5 million to win, but I should have reiterated, we do need money to win. You have to, you have to have money to be able to, you know, to campaign. You do need the basics. You need swag. You need to be able to advertise, you know, you need to be able to, you know, be able to travel. You know, all those things take money. But you definitely don't need $2.5 million for a campaign. You don't need all that PAC money. But you definitely need money to be able to at least compete a little bit so people can get to know who you are. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about small donations, we still need that money to be able to, you know, to have the things and the tools that we need. You know, we need staff. We want to be able to pay our staff a livable wage when they come onto our campaign. You know, there's all kinds of things, you know, to make $2.5 million, you know, I, I could have sent surrogates all over the state and mailers and had big TV ads and probably never had to work. But I don't think that's what it's about either. When we're running these campaigns like this, you know, I know these three women right here never just sat out and walk, woke up and thought, I'm going to be a politician. I surely didn't. <laughs> it's because, you know, 
Amy went through the struggle of losing her daughter. You know, Corey's dealing with everything she's doing, you know, dealing with in Ferguson. You know, I'd been an activist fighting for clean water and clean air and wondering if my children's going to get cancer every day. You just, we, you know, most of the candidates that you're seeing run for office all over across the country, they're not polished politicians. It's ordinary people wanting to bring change because we're not being served anymore. And so, you know, it's, it's totally different because we want to be, you know, if we're going to be public service, we want to know how to serve and we want to get out there and, and talk to the people that we're supposed to serve. So I would never, ever want to run a campaign where I just send out a mailer and have a commercial and not reach, to, you know, reach the people across this state. I wanted to know everything if I got elected. So when I went to serve in the Senate, then I knew what to do for the people here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you guys are all kind of touching on a, a broader theme that was addressed in the movie, too, that this isn't just about like each individual person. Like you all know your districts and your states very well. But there's this sort of interconnected interconnectedness that you sense throughout the film that this is about a broader movement. Like mm -hmm. if I lose, and that's OK if somebody else goes on to win. AOC won. So we've got one. So this is about like all of us. We get a little bit of the scene from Corey talking about Ferguson and these are all so relatable because I like I remember myself, Ferguson, when I was seeing these live streams and I thought this doesn't look like America. This is this is America. Like we have these militarized police cars. And then you hear about all these health issues. And we talk about Medicare for all. And Amy has that experience of her daughter, Shalin, dying because she didn't have proof of health insurance. And then with um, Paula, you were talking about this health issue in West Virginia that's largely being ignored because of special interests. So these are things that I think they're important and your stories are great and they're so crucial. But this is really a microcosm. Like the way that I saw the film was that this was four stories that are small pieces of a broader conversation because a lot of these stories are similar everywhere. And there's other people now running for Congress just because people like you decided, you know what, I'm not a polished politician but I can do it. So we have a new crop of candidates. We have people taking on the establishment, some very bold people, mind you, challenging Democratic leaders. Um, Michaela Wilkes taking on Steny Hoyer. We have Shahid Batar taking on Nancy Pelosi. So here's what I want to ask you guys, because now you're experienced. You guys, everyone knows who you are now. You know, people know you because you're in this film. So you are a powerhouse in and of itself. You know, you're, you're the people machine, unlike, you know, the special interests, money machines. So what would you say to these people running for Congress now? What's your one piece of advice? We'll start with you, Paula. Self-care. <laughs> that's, um, that's smart. Well, you know what? We, we went into this fast. I mean, it was like a storm. All of us were running crazy. We were there to support each other, have people to support you. You know, we're here to support other candidates, you know, always reach out to us and ask for our help and our advice, but take days off. I went to, during my campaign. Sometimes I went two and three months and it didn't see my kids. I mean, it really took a, a toll on my body even. So, you know, be power focused, but also at least take one day off a week if you can. Spend time with your family. Watch sit, you know, lay around watching Netflix if you have to. Self care is very, very important because if you don't, if you don't take care of yourself, you ain't going to be effective nowhere else. Yeah. How about you, Amy? You know, mine kind of echoes off of what um, Paula said. You know, um, and I, I, I really like to address that when when we're running and we're not typical politicians, it's usually for a personal problem, you know, personal issue that we have encountered, um, a tragedy, or that we have a friend of ours, we, we are running for a reason that is very personal. And, you know, when I, I didn't see it at the time when I was actually running, but afterwards looking back, and really when I saw the movie and I, I saw the difference, even the way I looked, and then I saw the scene of when I lost, I remember that moment. You know, a lot of people ask me, Amy, what were you thinking? You know, I've been holding Shillin's urn all day. And <clears throat> when, when I saw the numbers coming in, the first thing that came out of my mouth was, no, now more people are going to die. And I couldn't save them like I couldn't save Shillin. And so when we're running in campaigns like this, know that, you know, it's going to be much more personal and you're going to feel the weight of the community on your shoulders and that responsibility. But you have to remember that a loss is okay because even through losses in a campaign, we are still making movement forward. 
we are still chipping away at that old guard, at that old way of thinking and educating you know, our communities. And it's okay. Don't be afraid of a loss and go into it knowing that, you know what, I'm in it to win it. But if it, if I don't win it, that way of the community, it's still there, but you don't have to shoulder that alone. The community is with you and you have made progress and you just pick yourself up and get going again. Yeah. How about you, Corey? Uh, for me, it's knowing yourself. Go in like do that self-reflection, know who you are walking in the door to this because um, the good the good and the bad is going to come out of you because you're going to be tested mm -hmm. in all of it. So whether it's a character weakness or character strength, that thing is going to come out. And the, the, pro the issue is it comes out in public. It comes out pro maybe nationally. Um, so knowing you and then just being your authentic self, once you know who you are, I tell this to people, if you, if you need therapy, get therapy. You know, if you need, you know, medicine, get medicine. If you, you know, if you need ice cream, get ice cream, whatever your thing <laughs> is, you know, that's me. I do ice cream and yeah. therapy, yeah. but, um, you know, but I, but I, you know, but get those things and be your authentic, authentic self. The people, that's why people want you there is because you are who you are. You're not trying to assimilate or be like someone else. You're not trying to be this polished somebody that they can't believe in. Just the other day, um, I was speaking um, at an event and I had on ripped up jeans and I said, you know what, because I'm running as I am. You know, and because you don't, once I get to Congress, you're going to see me in ripped up jeans. So you might as well know now that I were, I wear ripped up jeans and big <laughs> earrings. Well, I have them now, but, 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 and so, the, so what I'm saying is if you know, if you can be your authentic self and know your mission, know the reason why you're running. Amy says it all the time. Amy says, know your why. I say, know your, know your mission, know the reason why you're doing it. Because in those days when you have heart, when it's hard and you, and the trolls are at you and money isn't there and all of these things are happening. You haven't seen your kids and just so much going on and you work a job, you know, um, when that, when all of that's happening, you have to know why you're still doing this. Yeah. And so that is, um, that will help pull you through. Yeah. Th these are all yeah. really good points because I don't think that people really think about this aspect of like self care because you just kind of get in it and you don't realize that you've been working kind of like Paula said, I've been doing this for like three months and I didn't even take a day off. That really takes yeah. a toll on you. And you guys are, if any, if the film demonstrated anything, you are normal people. And even if politicians generally seem robotic and they're re rehearsed, what I like so much about you guys and what the film does so well is it, it demonstrates these are normal human beings. Like the most powerful part in the film was when it showed each of you getting the results. And I'm so glad, like I knew that in the film, uh, Corey's election came after AOC's. I'm glad they showed AOC's last because that was such a gut punch to see all of your reactions. Because I mean, we all kind of reacted individually and we, we kind of coped with it after following you for so long. But seeing that toll after like a year and a half of just pouring your heart and soul into it, that was so rough. So one thing that I wanted to follow up on was with Paula Jean. You were talking to Joe Manchin. He planned a meeting with you. Did he follow through? Did you get that meeting that he promised you? And how did that go, if so? Well, uh, I did. And, you know, I can I honestly say that Joe Manchin is a personable person. He's done a lot of bad things in West Virginia, but he's he's very friendly. Um <laughs> We we sat down. <laughs> well, he is. I mean, he's, you know, everybody calls him Uncle Joe, and I mean, I, he he he's a really nice guy, and he treated me really well, which I was really surprised after the years of being ignored that he he sat down and actually talked to me like I was a human being and had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I guess that's that's how I should put it. But um, <laughs> you know, he he asked me how to get my votes, and I told him he'd have to earn them like with blood, sweat, and tears like I did. And I told him he could go out with a legacy um, like Robert Byrd did and Rockefeller did, and he could he could serve the people of West Virginia or he could move forward like in, down the same path that he has. And I didn't concede. I didn't endorse him. But I told him if he did good things that I would sing his praises, that, you know, the people of the West Virginia deserve better no matter what. And so the first step was, was he went down into a community called Minden, West Virginia. I spoke a lot about it in my campaign. It's a community that's been begging to be on the Superfund list for about 40 years. There was a company called Schaefer that buried PCBs and put PCBs into an abandoned coal mine there. And so people are dying at an alarming rate. And um, 
So he did put out a letter to the EPA and asked the EPA to put him on the Superfund site. And he sat down his campaign manager, Mara, to tour the community. And um, she acted like she really cared, but she was talking about getting them new roofs and new carpet and fixing their houses. And myself and the community told them that's not what they wanted. They wanted relocated because they're dying. And um, he took in water. He, he got him a truckload of water. But one thing that he did promise that he didn't follow through with was he promised a mobile health clinic for one of the universities. And uh, they came back and said that they could go to the sliding scale clinic um, in Oak Hill in the adjoining community, which is, is still detrimental for them. That's always been available. But, you know, they can't afford $600 for x-rays. And within the week, too, he was campaigning in the general um, trying to get the Republican vote. So he went full MAGA and said that he would endorse Donald Trump if if uh, he ran for office again. So I pretty much, to be blunt, I pretty much said Patrick Morsi and Joe Manchin could kiss my ass. Yeah, yeah, I don't blame you. Uh, one that's question. I love Paula. That, yeah, <laughs> I love the fire. I love the passion. Uh, one yeah. thing that I wanted to ask you, Amy, was there was this really, I think, incredible moment between you and your campaign manager, where you guys were both kind of in tears. This was, I think, before the results were uh, were learned. And you were saying, look, win or lose, you've been one of the best campaign managers. That reminded me of like a battle scene or a pre-battle scene <laughs> in like Game of Thrones, where it's like, okay, we may not come out. You know, it, like, can you talk about this? Because th what I learned is that these are all basically mini proxies for you they know that jumping on board with a grassroots candidate who isn't taking corporate money that's going to be difficult but they're still pouring all this time into it so first of all my question is do you still keep in touch with them and how do you keep people motivated or does it just happen organically and they're always motivated i definitely do keep in touch with them um i love them like family and when you go through this together that battle together as you saw they did whatever and whatever was necessary i mean spray painting signs i mean out the 113 degree weather knocking doors i mean we were doing garage sales to try to raise money I mean, we were doing like so much and and all of it came from a love of community when you love your community and you're fighting for the same things you know when you're fighting for social and 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 health care and racial and economic justice and lgbtq justice all every one of them represented a different facet and we were all intersectional as far as the way that our issues, you know, were intersectional with each other. Um, that love was immense. And that she, there were parts of the movie that didn't get in there, but people, we were bawling. I mean, I wasn't the only one crying. <laughs> we were all really upset because we knew that the, uh, the alternative was going to be that we were going to have someone who was just going to be interested in keeping status quo. Mm -hmm. And, that's what's happened and so it was crushing it was crushing more because we had been out in the community mike and had saw not only our own issues but the people that were even in the communities the more that you're out there and you're seeing all the pain and the despair and the suffering knowing you have the answers knowing that you have the drive and the fight but you just can't make it over that last hurdle. It was tough, but it's been motivating for all of them. They're, I, I'm happy to report they're all still involved in politics. Mm -hmm. Good. And a lot of different organizations through Nevada. You're welcome, Nevada. <laughs> Good. We're not done. We're not done. Um, it's been we haven't kept in touch as much as we want, Mike. But you know, I've been traveling around helping a lot of different states as well. I've been doing some work in Texas. Um, I've been traveling around to different states talking about health care. So, you know, I, I really have been able to use that time knowing that Nevada is in good hands um, and use it to also help spur other or other people in other states to get motivated and start fighting for these issues. Yeah, that was really something that I was curious about because it's not just that you're learning about these four women, but these people who are also kind of helping with the message and you kind of develop the sense of like, well, what are they doing now? Where are they at? You know, you really get invested in these people and it's especially powerful because this is not like a movie. This is a, a documentary with real people. Um, and going to Corey, the scene at the end where it kind of like ended with you, your story in the film ends with you crying after the loss. That was so difficult. But the good news, the good news is that that's not the end because you're running for Congress again. So what we saw was basically an hour and a half 
of you guys telling us how difficult it is to run for Congress. And my thought was, oh my God, I would never be up to this. I would not have the willpower. But you're in the race again, Corey. So tell me, what made you want to run again? Because it was hard enough the first time, but what made you want to keep going? So let me start with uh, one thing that, that you brought up with Amy. So when we lost, so my team was, when Amy was talking about ball and my team was, it was a mess. And, um, but they were balling and then they went over into a corner in the room at the watch party and they started organizing the next race, literally wow. at the party. And, and, um, and so they carried that on. They started having meetings and I'm still like, what the heck? You know, I'm still crying every day. I lost my job. I couldn't walk out. Like I was still in pain from an accident. Was, but they had, they stayed together and they kept it going. They put, it was just amazing. So they said, okay, you're going to run again. So just let us know when you're ready. Uh, so that was, um, so, you know, it was kind of like, and then people that didn't believe in me before running came to me during that, during those few weeks saying, Hey, if you run again, we, we, we understand now we'll support you. Um, and so, but I, I got back in the race personally though, one, because of the support and the love and then the, 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 and the terrible feeling that I felt when I I felt like I let everybody down, that people gave their time, their talent, and their treasure to in, in the hopes that I would make it in, and I didn't. And so that crushing feeling like you just let everybody across the doggone country down, um, as well as, the uh, even more importantly, the, um, your, the district. But um, also, we still have the same dang issues we had the day when I sat, decided to run the first time. We still have those same problems. We still have um, somebody that's never present in our district that, you know, that didn't grow here. You know, somebody that does not, that, that whose blood, sweat and tears isn't in this community and people are hurting and suffering. And the only way to change that is for somebody to run against them. And this is the thing I did better than anybody else has ever ran against him before um, wow. um, for, uh, for Congress. Um, I ran, I did better than him. Uh, a congressman ran against him when, uh, after, when redistricting. I did better than that person, and I did better than a, a sitting state senator. So those people had name recognition. Those people had money. I'm the one saying I'm not taking corporate PAC money, even though 250000 was offered to me, you know, and so, but we still did better. And I did, and we did better. And for the last three months, I was off my feet. My team did everything. So it's because of that. That meant that it's time. So I can't sit down just like the, the uh, sexual assault that I suffered. Um, um, I, I knew that with that and then all the things that I deal with. Um, one thing I just need to say, Mike, you know, what people don't realize is I'm still I, I still I'm still heavily surveyed. Um, surveilled from um, through Ferguson, from my, through my activism. I still get death threats. I still get ch uh, um, chased. I'm stalked. I get so much still happens to me, you know, and um, and I live a very dangerous, very dangerous life um, here. And um, and so with, if I sit down and I say enough is enough, then they can they win. They can continue to do those things. And so the so I'm staying in the forefront. I'm staying in their faces and I'm not going to back down because they can't win. This is why we love you. And this is why I, I recommended that my mom watch the film. And she calls me like immediately. She's like, these women are so amazing. I feel like I can do anything because it's like you watch these films with like these superheroes and whatnot, like Wonder Woman and whatnot. But you don't get role models like this, like where you have normal people who you can actually identify with, like normal people just like me, just like you who are doing something that is entirely possible that theoretically can be done by anyone. Now it's tough. That's really what the film showcased, but it's possible. So I want to end by kind of asking what happens next, because you guys all have a lot of political capital. Now you have the name recognition and you're kind of superstars now. So now <laughs> if you run for Congress, um, it's going to be a different story. So what is, uh, what does the future have in store for the stars of Knock Down the House? Well, before we get into that, I wanted to echo what Corey said. I sure. think that was one of the biggest, hardest thing, the hardest thing for me when I came home after my campaign was feeling like I dis, you know, the disappointment of not, you know, feeling like I may, I probably disappointed people. During my campaign, I lost three of my family members and seven of my friends. Oh my it was, a, you know, cancer, drug addiction, and suicide. 
So people were still dying. You know, during my campaign, I had my neighbor's baby daughter. He was sitting over there dying with black lung and cancer. And her coming to the fence every time I come home from the campaign, we need you, Paula Jean, we need you. You know, my aunt passed away during my campaign of cancer. My uncle was diagnosed with cancer, and he has black lung. Oh my God. And um, the hardest thing to come home, even though we have community organizers, you know, still working across the state. I've, I've been organizing even with everybody ever since the campaign, and I'll continue to do that no matter what. Um, it, it was hard to come home knowing that Joe Manchin was still going to still play a part in that. And, you know, Shelley Moore Capito, Democrat or Republican, you know, we have people in Congress that still play part of that. We still have people in the Capitol that still play a part in, in the death and destruction of West Virginia. And I thought about my brother, sister candidates. And I thought about, you know, being out in Ferguson with Corey when I was and seeing what she's going through. And I thought about Amy and her daughter. It was a, it was, it was really, really hard to come home and know that, you know, that was our biggest loss is because we're still going to keep going and we're still going to be community organizers, but these people are still in power too. Um, yeah. So that's why it's so vitally important. And I've said it before uh, and I'll say it again over and over again is if you can run for office from a local level to a federal level, do it as pastime, not only West Virginia, but everybody to invest in themselves because these problems are not going to go away. No matter how many times you've got some women that's getting some popularity on Knock Down the House or you hear somebody give good speeches, I humbly ask everybody in this country to vet your candidates because Amy was talking about changing the conversation but now everybody's progressive and everybody has a grassroots campaign when they're taking corporate and corporate PAC dollars and there's right. whatever needs to be said. And that's, that is infuriated Amen. me to beyond end that there's so many progressives now. Patrick Morsey said he was running a grassroots campaign in the <laughs> biggest joke of my life. We have to vet our candidates. I know it's hard to understand campaign financing. I fully didn't even understand campaign financing until I run for office. I know it's hard to start, you know, to look at voting records. It's hard to look at past speeches and previous speeches. I mean, everybody, you know, my grandmother always said everything that shines is not always gold. You know, it, they can paint a pretty picture, but are they really going to serve the people? I've heard incredible speeches from some of the sorry ass people get out that I know that are corrupt. We have to vet our candidates. We have to, yeah. or we're going to be in the same position. You know that it, they may sound glorious, but our lives are not going to be glorious. Yeah. Um, and as far as next steps, I am exploring my option. Paula Jean is not done. Um, there'll be some announcements really soon, but I'm not ready to make those announcements. Okay. Sounds good. How about you, Amy? Oh, I would love to run again, um, but I think I'm going to be sitting out this this uh, this election as I really want to help a certain presidential candidate win. <laughs> Are you allowed to say which presidential right. candidate that is? Oh, is it Beto? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I have to ask. I can't tell you how many times I people ask me, "Who are you supporting for president?" I don't know. Maybe the Revolution sticker or the Bernie book on the background, or might <laughs> or might let you know. <laughs> I would really like to be a part of um, of making sure and helping in any way I can um, with uh, Bernie's campaign. I'm also going to be helping, um, t you know, candidates that are needing to run. Um, I, and then, you know, definitely going to be helping out, too, that I know that are on, on board right now on this interview. Um, and then I will run again. I will run again. And I uh, I will go in there probably in 2022 and uh, and and make a hopefully make it into Congress this time. Yeah, because I'm going to do fundraisers and everything, and you get to come to my office. You know, I'm going to yeah. have it all laid out. You know, and I'll get you ready. If you not force me, I know where they live. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so let, since since you brought up Bernie, Amy, let me ask everyone else: um, Is it Bernie again for you guys? I fully endorse Bernie Sanders. Right on. I'm not saying yet. I'm rolling mine out. When I'm ready. All right, all right. I can respect yeah. that. 
Let, yeah, let me ask you guys this, though, because you all want to run for Congress. And here's one thing that really struck me. I mean, it's not surprising, but it still is draw jarring. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she is target en enemy number one, not just for the Democratic Party establishment, but for Republicans. And we see this with Ilhan Omar, other grassroots candidates or people that came into office. So are you ready? Like, how do you think you'd be able to cope with that? Because I'm just thinking psychologically how difficult this must be to be the number one target when you're one of the only people in Congress representing the people. Like, can you just respond to the response that AOC got after she won and how you think you would be able to cope with that if, you know, it remained the same, which I'm assuming it would? How about you, Corey? Because you're running again right now. Yeah, um, so I guess my the last five years of my life has been nothing but um, the first three years anyway was just a lot of scrutiny, a lot of... Um, uh, um, people saying some really terrible things about me, not knowing who I who I am, you know. And then I became a black identity extremist, and then all of those things. So I think for every for every bullet that's been shot into my car, for every um, everything that I've gone through, every time I was ran off of a road, I think that I pretty much I think I'm ready to be able to, if I could handle that, if I could stand up in front of tanks, if I could be, you know, if I can be assaulted yeah. by the police, I can handle that. Like, I think I, I, I think I'm ready for that. And I, and I know that, um, but I, when I see Alex every time and she can still say this, every time I see her, I say, how are you doing? How are you handling this? How are you sleeping at night? You know, because no matter what you say, people are there recording and putting out articles, you know, even when you don't want to, do you even get to go to the bathroom? Um, but, um, I think that that comes with it. That's part of it. So I think uh, I think that in the same way we grew to be to this point because we're different people than we were when we first decided to run. You know, we've give, our skin has thickened and so many other things. And so in the same way, I think that we'll all be ready. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Amy? I agree. I think that we've all been brought it brought to this level by the amount of persecution that we face, even just with announcing. And I have to say that, um, you know, Alex is a human being. I mean, she is dealing with an immense amount of pressure. And, um, you know, all of us, we offer words of encouragement when we see each other. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think all of us know that what we're up against is the fight of our lives. Yeah for this yeah. country yeah. and in even even the ones that didn't make it we're still feeling repercussions from us standing up publicly for mm -hmm. us having a voice in our communities in our abilities to have jobs and our uh, people you know the way that they treat us we're all, every one of us across the board has had to pay prices many of us can't get jobs in our career fields anymore many of us because of running for office and being that outspoken but that's, that's what it takes to go and have a movement that's what it takes to stand up against a machine and against power we have to be willing to sacrifice and say come what may bring it on <laughs> yeah yeah that that makes a lot of sense how about you paula well, I've, I was already facing a lot of scrutiny before I run for office. I mean, especially during um, the Massey era here. We, it was, it, if you be, if you were begging for water and you were fighting against industry, you were, you know, you were labeled as a tree hugger and people threatened your life. And so, you know, I, I've, I've been through a lot of that already. Um, it was, it, it, it was amplified probably 10 times after running for office. You know, there was a lot more scrutiny. I had my life threatened. I had people follow me. Um, but the struggle, the struggle here at home is no greater than any struggle that we can face, mm. you know, like Ferguson, like, you know, losing their children because we, you know, and people dying because they don't have health care or people dying of drug addiction in this state and, and dying of cancer. You know, people think that they think it's extreme, but I've said it, you know, what they've asked me, why aren't you afraid for your wife? Because if things don't change, I'm going to die anyway. Wow. You know, people die here of alarming rate. And that's real. Yeah. That's real. So, you know, I think that, you know, you just develop you just develop this this thick skin because, you know, my biggest fear is if I, my kids will get, you know, I worry if my kids will get cancer every day. Mm -hmm. And um, I would a whole lot rather fight than lay down and take it. And so, you know, 
when and if I run for office again, it's 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 no bigger than the battle we probably have at home. Yeah. yeah. Well put. So before we end, I just want to give you guys each the opportunity to kind of plug whatever you're doing, your Twitter, because obviously we're not going to hear, you know, this isn't going to be the last that we hear from you. So if you guys can just direct us to what you need, Corey, I know you're running for Congress and you need yes. money. So plug all of that and we'll go through each of you. If, if we've learned anything from the documentary is that money is key, unfortunately, but that's the way that it is. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yes. Yeah. Please, if you have anything that you could give that you can donate, um, we need every every single every single dollar that um, somebody is willing to give. Um, you can look us up on Act Blue. My name is Corey C O R I B U S H. I'm the Good Bush, um, and uh, and and um, um, or you can just go to my website at uh, coreybush.org o r g and um uh, go there donate um we love we would love for you to do a recurring donation because that way we know how much money we have every month and we can kind of plan so if you're able to do that even if it's just ten dollars if that's all you have we appreciate it so go go on there and um and uh, make a donation tell your friends you got to tell other people thank you for your donation but please tell other people to donate um and my twitter is at cory bush uh, Facebook and everything else is at Corey Bush. Reach out to me. Uh, we need help. We need volunteers remotely and um, locally. And um, just uh, help us amplify this message. All right. Um, Amy? Yeah, so right now, definitely keep an eye out on my um, social media. I will be, um, you know, again, releasing a book for those who are wanting to uh, run for office or who are just interested in the story of what it was like to be running um, and and how you actually, I really want it to be a transformative book that is going to help give people, um, you know, that, that power within to, you know, how do you transform from a place of grief and feeling less than to using that as power to go forward and fight for the people. So keep a look at it, Amy. The number four, the people dot com. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at Amy, the number four, the people dot com. And as far as what I'm doing, you know, go to our revolution dot com and Bernie Sanders dot com. Definitely can use people, you know, volunteering your time, uh, donating, you know, of all of us are running. We definitely need to have somebody who's going to be able to. Um, you know, implement any of these these issues and policies that we're fighting for. So it is so important. As much as you scrutinize someone who's in your um, who's in the House or the Senate, you need to do the same for someone who's going to be the president. And as far as I can see, the only person I know that's going to be putting the fight necessary to win on the issues that we were fighting for is going to be Bernie Sanders. So sorry, I have to do that shameless plug. <laughs> no, hey, this is where you get to plug whatever you want. So, <laughs> so <Bernie Sanders> <laughs> Love it, love it. Um, how about you, oh, Paula? Let me, real quick, let me plug. Let me let me plug sure. before Paula goes. Let me plug. I need Twitter to verify me. This is this is getting. Ridiculous. I need that again too. Okay. Me too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you verified, Amy? I am. <laughs> you are, oh wow! <laughs> they I they won't verified. verify you if now they won't verify you if you're a candidate, and so oh really? I can never get verified because I'm a lifetime candidate, it seems. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was verified at Paula Jean too. I think it first got on. That, yeah, they it changed in January 2018. Mm, yeah, yeah, I yeah. They're they're very stingy with the verifications nowadays. I hear. Yeah. I was verified at Paula Jean 2018, but when I went Paula Jean 2020, they I wasn't that could, I wasn't verified anymore. It went away. Mm. Ugh. Do you do you want to plug anything, Paula? Um. Well, you can follow me on Twitter, Paula Jean 2020. You can find me on Facebook, Paula Jean Swearingen. Um. But I am plugging for my brothers and sisters as they're still running for office. Donate to Corey Bush. Donate to Anthony Clark. Um, look at the slate of brand new Congress candidates that are about to be recruited and um, help donate and volunteer for brand new Congress so we can. And also look at your local candidates. Local candidates do not get a lot of support. We had a lot of support as congressional candidates, but um, local races, it's really, really hard. Um, if you can knock on doors and donate and phone bank for local candidates that don't have the available resources that we do. 
um, take a you know try to try to pick a congressional candidate and a local candidate to support because it's really important not just you know not just Congress, and start looking at the Senate, and um, we need to vet more people to run for Senate right now because no matter what's going through the House, it's getting knocked down in the Senate. So we need some more people to run for Senate. So if anybody has the guts to do it, we need more people in those seats. And I think that's it for me. Yeah, just donate and keep watching. All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming on. It's been an absolute privilege to talk to you again and to see the documentary. Um, it was just such a great work. It, it has 100% score on Rotten Tomatoes, by the way. So obviously it's good. And I'm just so excited to see what you guys are doing next and, you know, what, what the movement has in store. Uh, I know that we're going to hear more from you. So thank you all so much for coming on. One more plug. I want to thank you and other people like you as we have we've been running for yeah. office, because if it wasn't for you, we would have not got the name recognition that we did. Thank you for amplifying our voices and supporting us. Thank you. That means yeah. a lot. That means a lot. You are part of Amy for the people. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard because I don't it's difficult because I every time that I bring on a candidate, I try to have this theme of, you know, um, they need money. They're not taking corporate money, but that means you have to come in. So I don't know how successful that is. I hope that you guys got boosts whenever you came on like an indie show like this. But certainly, uh, I'll be doing whatever I can as loud as I possibly can scream, use my platform to help you guys. Because um, like the documentary kind of illustrated, this isn't just about people like individual one person. This is about a movement, which I feel like I'm part of that movement. And I know people watching feel like they're part of that movement. So, you know, anything to help our brothers and sisters. Yes, because like yesterday, I, we, we brought in $18. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's the realization. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, it's a tough you, struggle. Mike. Yes, we, we will try whatever we can. So thank you all so much. Thank you for running again. Thank you for dedicating yourselves to the cause and just tremendous sacrifice. It truly is. It's so meaningful to people. And let me just say one more thing. The people who watch, like, I think they would have tuned out of politics had it not been for people like you, because it's so difficult to stay like motivated when constantly we're beat down. We see everything unfolding, you know, in D.C. And there's all of these local issues on top of that. So if there were people that just gave up, if there was nobody like you guys willing to run, then it would be very difficult to stay motivated. So just understand that what that means to us is huge. Your, your contribution is tremendous. So thank you all so much. It really is meaningful. Thank you. Thank you.